Okay, um, so I assume then that you all can hear me, um, and so we'll, we'll make a start with this afternoon's uh, technical forum talk. Uh, so just uh, to briefly introduce myself, uh, my name is Ian Bethune, um, I'm project manager here at EPCC, um, and so this afternoon um, I'm just going to be sharing some of the experience we had in the last uh, in the last year, the last six months particularly, uh, with porting one particular application, CPDUK, onto Intel Xeon Phi. So uh, here, here's an outline of, of where I'll be going this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about what the Xeon Phi is uh, and the, the architecture uh, of the Xeon Phi. Uh, then the sort of process we went through with application porting uh, using CP2K as an example. Um, but also trying to draw some uh, broader conclusions uh, and give some pointers for things that you might want to look out for if you're thinking of porting applications yourself. Um, I'll briefly talk about some of the performance results uh, and, and then summarize, uh, as I say, some of the, the broader lessons um, that, that, that we learned from this experience that might benefit, uh, benefit yourselves in the future. Uh, and finally, some, some pointers to where you can find more information. We won't be able to cover everything um, that you might like to know about the Xeon Phi uh, in the next, uh, say, half an hour or so that I'll be speaking. So uh, as a starting point, and uh, just to give you some of the terminology that I'll be using, uh, Xeon Phi is somewhat confusing. And so, so starting uh, from just before 2010, Intel had a, a research project uh, known as Project Larrabee, um, where they planned to develop uh, a, a GPU uh, based on some of the technology uh, from their, their x86 processors, uh, which was originally uh, envisaged as a competitor to uh, NVIDIA and ATI GPUs at the time. Now, this uh, project uh, was shelved in, in 2010, um, but what came out of it um, was this architecture called the, the Many Integrated Core or MIC architecture. Uh, and this is, uh, well, what it is, is it's many uh, x86 cores integrated together into a, a single uh, compute unit. Uh, and it was designed uh, to scale to you know, 50, 60 uh, cores on a single device, so much more than you might have in a, a traditional uh, multi-core CPU. So that was the architecture that came from Larrabee. Now, the name uh, Xeon Phi uh, is, is Intel's uh, product name uh, for some of the, uh, the, the chips that they've built using the, the mic architecture. So for example, the particular uh, piece of Xeon Phi hardware that, that we used uh, during the supporting exercise we're going to talk about was the uh, Xeon Phi 5110P, uh, and there are a number of different uh, variants of that. Uh, all branded as Xeon Phi. And if anybody's ever talking to you about Xeon Phi, they will quite often drop into these code names, uh, Knight's Ferry, Knight's Corner, and Knight's Landing. So these refer to different revisions uh, of the, the mic architecture. So the original uh, prototype came from the, the Larry project, uh, and just subsequently from that was called Knight's Ferry. Uh, the current uh, generation of the architecture, which is what was productized as the Xeon Phi in early 2013, is referred to as Knight's Corner. Uh, and then uh, sometime next year, um, it's expected the next generation of the architecture uh, called Knight's Landing um, will be coming out. So uh, the, the terms Xeon Phi, uh, Knight's Corner, uh, and Mike are sometimes used interchangeably in, in this context, and I'm sure I will too. Okay, so to, to give you the, the, the bare bones of, of what the Xeon Phi is, um, so it's a, it's a coprocessor uh, which gets attached to a host CPU via a PCI Express bus. So there's a, a picture of uh, the, the 5110P. So it's, uh, the P stands for passively cool, but it's, it's a, a PCI uh, package, and you can, you can get them in various uh, server setups uh, or, or HPC machines. What's inside? Uh, the package, so there are 60 cores. Um, so these are simplified x86 cores based on uh, an earlier uh, Pentium design. So they're very much uh, low power. Uh, they feature only uh, in-order execution of instructions. So they're much more uh, 
the, the circuitry is much less complicated than, the, than a general purpose x86 chip like the, the standard Xeons that you might find in your server. And they also run at a reasonably low clock speed of just over uh, 1 gigahertz. But there are 60 of these cores, and they're all packed into uh, the, this uh, single Xeon Phi package. Uh, each of the cores uh, runs uh, four virtual threads. So these are uh, similar to hyper threads um, that you find in uh, modern Xeons. The, the difference being uh, that these four virtual threads are executed in, in round robin order. Uh, so one instruction from each uh, virtual thread before the, the first one gets a, a chance to execute again. And uh, so this uh, really says that in order to get the maximum performance out of the Xeon Phi, you need to be able to uh, fill up these uh, 60 cores with four virtual threads each for a total of 240 virtual threads. Uh, so I said these uh, cores are based on an early Pentium design. They have 64-bit addressing, uh, and they also have a 512-bit uh, vector processing unit attached to each of the 60 cores, uh, and, and that gets shared uh, by, by these four virtual threads. Uh, so if you uh, do the multiplication of the clock speed by the number of cores, uh, and that you can do eight uh, floating point uh, uh, FMA operations per cycle, you get to just over one gigaflop of total performance uh, for the Xeon Phi coprocessor. Uh, also on the, uh, the Xeon Phi, uh, there is uh, eight gigabytes of main memory, so this is quite comparable uh, to what you would see uh, on a GPU, uh, and there's also a, a cache coherency uh, system there as well. Uh, so, so all these uh, 60 cores uh, have shared access to this global memory, which is uh, separate from the main uh, CPU host memory. Uh, these are uh, separated over the, the PCI bus in the same way as, as a standard GPU. And so here's just a a diagram of the architecture. So this is taken from a slide that Intel presented uh, a couple of months ago at uh, an Archer Xeon Phi training course. And uh, so you may have seen this before. Uh, but you can see all the, the cores, each with their uh, individual L2 caches, which are maintained uh, coherently. They're connected to this, uh, this ring bus, which connects the, the cores not only to each other, um, but also to the main memory. Uh, and, and that architecture has some uh, some performance implications, which we'll we'll cover uh, shortly. So uh, Intel have uh, really positioned the Xeon Phi as a coprocessor, uh, as opposed to an accelerator, which is the, the term we normally use to talk about uh, uh, GPUs or anything which kind of augments the the, the CPU uh, for performance. And uh, the reason they would call it a coprocessor is because it has these uh, number of different operation modes, uh, including, uh, first of all, native mode, where it's basically the Xeon Phi running as a, a standalone uh, many core uh, many core system uh, running Linux. So you can, uh, you can log in, uh, you can uh, build your code, uh, you can run, uh, run your program either in serial or in parallel. Um, and you can see all these individual uh, individual processors uh, that, that you can use there. And so th this is a kind of uh, easy way into using Xeon Phi. Uh, so for anyone familiar with programming for uh, for multi-core desktop or server machines, uh, this is exactly the same kind of model. Uh, and when I talk about the, the CP2K uh, case study, uh, the porting we did there, we, we only used native mode. Um, but there are also other modes of execution. Um, so there is offload mode, and this is uh, very similar uh, if you've uh, used uh, CUDA, for example, for NVIDIA GPUs. So you have a main program uh, which uh, might be multi-threaded uh, and runs on the host CPU, and then it offloads uh, particular regions of your code uh, to run on the coprocessors, so in this case on the, the Xeon Phi. Uh, so Intel have uh, some uh, directives which you can add to your code uh, to, to mark out these offload regions uh, and annotate particular pieces of data um, which should be moved to or from uh, the Xeon Phi uh, before or after the, uh, the offload region is run. Uh, 
in addition, uh, a similar model to offload uh, Intel also support uh, OpenCL, um, which is uh, a sort of cross-platform uh, library for, for programming accelerator type devices, um, where again, in the same model, uh, you have a main programming on the CPU, but instead of using the Intel markup, uh, you can uh, define uh, OpenCL kernels, which you compile up for the Xeon 5 device, uh, and then you can launch those uh, at various points during your program to do computation on the Xeon 5. So now I want to just cover briefly some of the, the programming models. Uh, so I've talked a bit about the architecture and the operation modes. Uh, one of the uh, real pluses of the, the Xeon Phi is it supports uh, a wide range of, uh, of programming models, uh, both you know, standard, uh, standard programming models uh, for parallel programming like MPI and OpenMP, but also a range of uh, Intel proprietary and, and other programming models as well. Um, so what do you need to program for a Xeon Phi? Uh, at present, you, you do need an Intel compiler. Um, so that you can generate uh, the, the, the vector instructions uh, that, that will be needed to, to use that vector unit on each of the cores, um, but you can program in standard uh, C, C++, or Fortran, uh, compile up your code uh, for the Xeon file and run it there uh, in native mode, or compile uh, an executable with offload regions uh, to, to run in offload mode. If you want to do parallel programming using MPI, you have a number of different options of how you can do this. As I said before, you can launch a parallel program uh, in native mode, either on the single Xeon Phi, or in fact, you can create an MPI communicator which spans multiple Xeon Phi's. Uh, if you're using the, the offload modes, you can use MPI uh, between nodes containing your host CPUs, and each host CPU can offload an individual Xeon Phi. So this is uh, similar to how you might program a large cluster with GPUs, for example. And it's also uh, possible to create an uh, MPI communicator which spans both the host's cores and the Xeon Phi cores. Um, uh, we, we didn't test this mode, um, but it is possible to do uh, if you want to take advantage of, of the cores that are available uh, on both the, the host and on the Xeon Phi itself. Uh, OpenMP is obviously another widely used programming model for uh, threaded programming. Um, so th this can be used uh, in a couple of ways. In offload mode, uh, you can use OpenMP within the, uh, the offload regions that you define in your code. Um, so when you, you, you offload a region, uh, a number of threads will be spawned uh, on the Xeon Phi uh, up to 240, as I said, could run at one time uh, and to execute your, your offload region. Uh, and in native mode, um, you can also use OpenMP. Uh, and as in the case study I'm about to talk to, you can do it in hybrid with MPI. Uh, so you use a combination of, of MPI and OpenMP to get enough threads of execution uh, to fill up the 240 virtual threads on the device. Uh, and as I said, there are a number of other uh, approaches, including some of the Intel proprietary things like thread building blocks and Silk Plus, uh, OpenCL I already mentioned, uh, and OpenACC, uh, which is an open standard for directive-based programming of accelerators, uh, I believe also now has uh, support for C and Phi in some of the compilers. So to give you a flavor of, of what's involved um, with porting an application to C and Phi, I just want to talk about a specific example that we worked on in the last year. Um, so this is the, uh, using the CP2K program. So this is a uh, an atomistic simulation program which uses density functional theory, uh, but also uh, other frameworks like classical mechanics uh, and post-DFT approaches. Um, a little advert for CP2K here. Um, so you can do a wide range of things, uh, like this Swiss Army knife with lots of blades on it. Um, under the, the section open source, just to give you some uh, information about the actual code itself, it's a very large code. Uh, around about a million lines of code. It's the third most used code on Archer, so we felt it was quite relevant uh, to discuss here. Uh, a large number of people are, are, are familiar with it. And it's not a trivial sized code uh, to port. So this is all done uh, thanks to funding from the, the European Praise Project, um, which 
in general was looking at uh, novel and emerging architectures and, and programming models. Uh, so this case study was done in that context. So as I said, we used uh, native mode. So in essence, porting is very, very simple. Uh, you just have to compile your code up with the Intel compiler and add this dash M mic flag uh, to generate uh, machine code uh, for, for the, the mic architecture, specifically the, the vector instruction set there. Um, in practice, uh, in our case, that was a lot harder than it might seem. Uh, one reason for that is because several bugs existed uh, in the CP2K code, uh, which were exposed when we moved to the Intel compiler. Um, and conversely, we also exposed a number of bugs in the Intel compiler and the Intel math kernel library, um, which were exposed by using CP2K. And so we spent actually quite a lot of time uh, at the beginning of the porting process, uh, iterating through and, and fixing all these bugs. So we, we finally got to a stage where we were confident uh, in the results we were getting from the code. And so certainly for CP2K and also in general for CN5 programming, I'd certainly recommend using uh, the most recent versions of the Intel compiler suite and the math kernel library. Um, I have to say, Intel were very responsive in terms of, uh, of fixing these things as well. So if you're going through this process yourself and find uh, bugs, then by all means, do report them uh, to Intel support, and, and, and they should hopefully fix them. So one of the other uh, things as well as using the Intel compiler is to make sure you're using uh, libraries uh, such as MKL, which are optimized uh, for the Xeon Phi. Uh, so, for example, one of the operations within CP2K uh, and also within many other codes is doing FFTs. Uh, so we use the, the FFTW library, um, which is a kind of almost de facto standard, such that uh, MKL actually has an FFTW compliant interface uh, to it. Uh, and, and so what we found actually was just compiling the FFTW source code uh, using the dash M mic flag, so generating uh, instructions for the Xeon Phi, was still much, much slower than MKL. So for 1D FFTs, uh, we found MKL gave a speed up of up to about five times for, uh, for an N equals 256 length FFT. Um, and for 3D FFTs, MKL could be up to three times faster. And so this is basically because uh, MKL has uh, included in it support for these uh, these vector instructions, which FFTW uh, is unable to take advantage of. So it's well worth, uh, and MKL also includes uh, various other operations from, from BLAS and LAPAC uh, that are optimized for the Xeon Phi. Um, actually, as a, a matter of fact, MKL can also be used uh, in the offload model. Uh, so there's a, a feature uh, which is controlled by environment variables called automatic offload. Uh, where uh, MKL calls in your source code can be transparently to you, the programmer, uh, offloaded and run on the Xeon file and the results returned. Uh, and there are some environment variables allow you to control uh, for what operations and what data sizes that happens. So one of the other issues uh, as I mentioned, uh, was if you have, if you want to create 240 virtual threads to run uh, on the Xeon Phi to fill up all of these uh, these 60 cores, each with the four virtual threads, you need to think quite carefully about how you how you place those individual threads, particularly uh, in, in the context we're working where we're using a mixed mode MPI OpenMP approach. Uh, so you have some number of MPI processes, each of which spawn a certain number of OpenMP threads. So as this uh, figure shows, if you're just using MPI or just using OpenMP, the default placements uh, work quite right, uh, work quite well. Um, but for the mixed mode, uh, they, they don't. In actual fact, you end up with uh, quite poor placement. Uh, I believe, not, so at the time when we did this about a year ago, we basically had to manually place uh, individual threads onto the cores so that they were close to the parent processor. Um, my understanding is now this is uh, handled much better by the uh, 
by the runtime, and there are a bunch of uh, environment variables called uh, KMP affinity, which can control this. And the uh, the best option to choose is the, what's called the balanced placement, uh, whereby the the threads are spread out to load balance all over the 60 available cores, but kept close to the the parent process, or as close to as possible, subject to that constraint. Uh, and as you can see, the difference. Uh, between the blue line and the green line, uh, getting the correct uh, placement right can make a massive difference to the, the performance that you can achieve. So I'm just going to briefly talk about some of the uh, the performance results that, that we obtained. And so I'd say when we did the initial port, which was really just uh, compiling up the code for the Xeon Phi uh, and then experimenting with different task placements, so we're using the existing parallelization that, that was in CP2K, um, which was really designed for uh, fat multi-core MPP machines uh, like Archer and like Hector before it. Um, so to a certain extent, it wasn't a great surprise that when we first ran this, we found that really we, we were getting performance which was very poor, uh, around eight times slower than the, just using the, the eight core Sandy Bridge CPU, which hosted the Xeon Phi. So this is just kind of what we got out of the box for uh, compiling the code up and fixing a few bugs. So we spent a little bit of time uh, trying to optimize the code uh, to, to scale a bit better and get better performance out of the Xeon Phi. Um, and the main cause for, for poor scaling uh, in this case was uh, the, the OpenMP parts. So you need to use some OpenMP because uh, you don't have enough uh, enough memory uh, to, to, to fully run 240 uh, MPI processes. You want to do some memory sharing. Um, but in practice, the, the actual OpenMP parallelization doesn't scale as well as you might like. Uh, so you take a, a scaling hit as well uh, when you do that. Um, so just from looking at the, the output from, uh, from our profiling tool, uh, we went ahead and parallelized two of the routines uh, which showed up to be expensive and didn't scale well, well, well with OpenMP. And the, the other thing that's worth mentioning, I, I kind of hinted at this earlier when I was talking about the uh, the core architecture, which is a very much a simplified uh, Pentium-derived core architecture, which only supports, for example, in-order execution of instructions uh, and is uh, missing uh, features like, like branch prediction, uh, out-of-order execution that you would find on a modern CPU. Uh, when you look at the profile of your code running on Xeon Phi, you might find that routines which you had not considered before as being expensive start to show up in the profile, uh, and, and that's certainly what we found here. Uh, one other thing that's worth saying here is also the, the total memory usage uh, was a particular constraint for us. Uh, so as I said, there was 8 gigabytes of memory on, the, on our Xeon Phi card. Um, but the algorithms, which are used particularly for the OpenMP parallelization, were really designed for, uh, as I said, uh, fat multi-core nodes where you might expect to have uh, a gigabyte per core or more available. Uh, so they're not particularly memory efficient. Uh, and that meant actually the best case performance you kind of the naive port, which used 128 total threads, that was only using half of the uh, the, the total cores, uh, total threads available on the Xeon Phi. So it's not entirely surprising that the performance is so poor. Um, but even having done a little bit of work on, on the porting, we did manage to improve the performance somewhat, but our, our end result was still slower than, than just using the CPU. Um, so uh, you know, there, there, there's no free lunch here. You do need to think hard about your code uh, and put some work into to optimizing it. So I'd like to just draw some uh, some general conclusions, uh, some of which I've touched on already. Um, so first is that you know, thanks to the support for all these uh, standard and uh, widely used programming models, porting codes onto Xeon Phi is relatively easy, um, arguably easier than, for example, uh, converting your code to, to use CUDA. Um, but this is uh, the two caveats. This is if the source code is already portable. So as we found, uh, we had a number of bugs related to using the Intel compiler, uh, and that you also have uh, an efficient uh, parallelization scheme that allows you to get uh, to the level of parallelism you need to fill up these uh, 240 virtual threads. So our experience of yeah, using native mode 
does show that this is a very easy way uh, into using zeroed fire. Um, but in practice, the constraint of having only 8 gigabytes of memory and having to find 240 threads of execution uh, to fill all these virtual uh, thread slots on the 60 cores is a hard, strong scaling program. Um, uh, and we find that certainly you'd have to take a different approach uh, to some of the algorithms you might choose to use in a more memory rich environment, uh, so coming from these uh, fat multi core nodes that I mentioned. Uh, and most probably, uh, and certainly from some of the other uh, sort of case studies and, and reports that I've read, uh, codes which are, are very data parallel and allow uh, a high level of fine grained parallelism. Uh, typically would work very well on the Xeon Phi. Uh, so it's easier to find uh, those many hundreds of threads of, of parallel execution. Now, you might hope um, that you could do this uh, approach that I mentioned earlier, where you run a single MPI communicator across multiple Xeon Phi's um, to allow you to get a, a larger total memory. Um, but unfortunately, in the current implementation at least, Communicating from one Xeon Phi to another requires going via the host, so there's quite a, a great deal of overhead involved with that, uh, and it doesn't necessarily help as much as you might like. So from our experience, we think that offload mode might be a, have been a better approach uh, to take for CP2K because some of these uh, complex uh, logic and deep function call hierarchies uh, that exist within the code are much, much slower on the, on the KNC, on the Knight's Corner core, um, than they are just on the CPU. Um, and, and so the idea that you could run all those on the CPU and just choose the kernels you know, where you could uh, get lots of parallelism, uh, offload those onto uh, the Xeon Phi, and, and keep the main threads of execution running on the CPU is quite attractive. Uh, and this is certainly uh, something that, that, that we think could work in the future. I've talked a lot about parallelism and scaling, but it's also worth saying that you still need uh, to have a well-optimized code in serial for the Xeon Phi processors. Um, so there is, there is support in the Intel compilers to generate uh, vector instructions directly from your source code, um, but our experience was that it didn't always find all the uh, the vectorizable loops that, that were there, and sometimes it's necessary to help the compiler a little uh, by aligning arrays uh, specifically or, or, or padding them uh, to allow the compiler to, to identify uh, candidate loops for vectorization. And these uh, P54C cores, these are the cores uh, on the, the Knight's Corner, are very, very slow, and they have a slow clock speed uh, and as I said, they, they lack some of the uh, functionality uh, in terms of instruction scheduling that you'd find in a modern CPU. Uh, and also the, the memory bandwidth um, to this 8 gigabytes of memory is quite limited. Uh, this is partly because of this uh, ring bus architecture I showed in one of the earlier slides, where all cores have to share uh, access to this ring bus to, to pull data from memory into their local caches, and also cache coherency traffic travels over that same network. Uh, so unless you have, as I said, like a data parallel code where each core works with individual data elements and doesn't refer too often to elements in other locations in memory, um, then memory bandwidth can really be a, a constraint on the total performance. Uh, and that was part of the, the issue with, with, with CP2K as well. Um, so those two issues in particular are expected to improve uh, in the Knight's Landing card, um, which Intel have released some details on. So I think the, the cores are, are going to be derived from the, uh, the Atom uh, low power cores. So they will have, for example, out of order execution, uh, advanced branch, branch prediction and such like. Uh, and there's also uh, a different uh, memory architecture where there'll be a much larger pool of global memory, uh, I think up to uh, some 300 gigabytes uh, per Xeon Phi, and also uh, uh, on-chip memory, uh, which can act like a sort of configurable L3 cache uh, or, or fast global memory. 
Right, so, so those issues to a certain extent will go away, um, but still having to find uh, you know, a couple of hundred of threads worth of parallelism will, will remain as an issue. So to summarize, I mean, clearly Xeon Phi offers, uh, offers the promise of, of good performance gain, and this has been realized um, in a number of applications, although not particularly in the, the case that I was talking about today. That was just based on our, uh, some of our experience here. Um, the performance that you can get is comparable with current generations of GPUs, and the performance that's expected from the night landing will be comparable with future generations of GPUs. Um, and similar to GPUs, this will work best for data parallel codes, uh, where you can find all this parallelism. Uh, what Xeon Phi does well is it's easy to use, um, thanks to the support for uh, all these uh, existing uh, programming models. It does make the porting uh, somewhat simpler, um, but the, the difficult problem of finding parallelism or, or designing a new highly parallel algorithm still remains. Uh, so as I, I mentioned, uh, the Knights landing, the next generation of the Xeon Phi architecture, is expected sometime next year. Um, a couple of features of that which are will, will change things somewhat. One is uh, that they are going to be self-hosting, so they're going to move away from this offload model uh, where you have a host CPU and a Xeon Phi attached. The Xeon Phi itself uh, will, will be a standalone system, uh, so it's kind of like uh, native mode today, and you'll be able to uh, connect multiple uh, night landing cards together using MPI. Uh, I mentioned already the, uh, the, the difference in memory architecture. Um, and one other thing which I think will, will also help is they'll move away from this uh, one-off uh, Knight's Corner vector instruction, uh, instruction set to the standard uh, or the, the coming standard AVX 512. Um, so this should open up, I think, uh, support from, from more compilers. Uh, as I mentioned, having the, the Atom cores will be somewhat uh, more sophisticated than the, the current Pentium derived cores on Knight's Corner. So uh, if you want to uh, find out some more about Xeon Phi, um, there's uh, a couple of pointers of places to look. Um, the first link there is to the uh, training course that Intel ran in collaboration uh, with Archer. Uh, a couple of months ago in Bristol. There are a number of slides uh, and exercises uh, that you might want to look at there on the Archer website. Uh, the, there are two technical reports available on the PRACE website, which uh, give much more detail on the CP2K porting and optimization um, than I was able to cover today. Uh, and finally, Intel themselves run Xeon Phi uh, software development webinars. Um, the slides and video from those are archived on the Intel website. So if you do plan to uh, to try using uh, Xeon Phi, uh, I recommend that you, you go there and, and follow up on some of that information. OK, so that's um, all I had to say. Um, so now really it's uh, over to you guys. Uh, if you would like to ask any questions, I'd be happy to answer. So question from Simon. Do you focus a lot on the need to parallelize enough to use 240 virtual threads, but is using 240 virtual threads necessarily faster than just 60 threads, one per physical core? So the answer is yes, it is, because the, uh, the cores on the Xeon Phi will issue one instruction for each of the virtual threads in a round robin. Uh, so if you're only running one virtual thread per core, you only have uh, one quarter, I think, of the instruction issue rate. Um, and also, the, one of the reasons that Intel recommends running four virtual threads per core is it allows you to hide, uh, to a large extent, the memory access latency as well. Um, so if you're only running one virtual thread per physical core, I think you'll be even more exposed to uh, the, the the delays caused by this uh, this ring bus architecture. No problem. Anyone else want to ask anything? So if anybody has any more general questions uh, about Archer, um, 
it's also a good place uh, to discuss them if you would like to. So the question, what is the potential to use MKL with offload mode in CP2K? So yes, you can use MKL uh, in the, the in the offload model. Now, most of the computationally dominant routines in CP2K are not spent uh, doing uh, BLAS or layback operations. Uh, so I suspect uh, that there's not too much benefit from doing that for this particular application. Um, also, I mean, we concentrated on doing native mode. Uh, it was the, the sort of easiest place to start. Um, I'd certainly be more interested now, uh, having done that, looking at offload mode, I think that would be more suited. Um, and there are certainly some problems um, that you can run with CP2K, uh, which might make use, uh, particularly of eigensolvers, for example, um, which could certainly be accelerated using MKL on the Xeon Phi. Uh, so there probably is some mileage in this, um, but not for the particular problem uh, and the mode of operation that we were investigating. So the question is, for Archer, is there any way to specify several particular nodes to run a benchmark? Try to specify the node IDs they were refused. So the question is then, can you specify exact node IDs? Or can you request particular node IDs through the batch system? So the short answer is I don't know. Um, I can certainly find out um, if you could maybe drop me an email um, so I have your contact details, um, then uh, I'd be happy to answer that one offline. OK, anyone else have any other questions? Um, I mean, the, the main bulk of the, the presentation clearly is over. I'm happy to, uh, to stay around until uh, until everyone has drifted away, or, or, or uh, so feel free uh, to leave if you uh, if you want to, or if you have more questions, uh, pop them into the chat and we can talk about them.